Yes, great. Happy to be sitting down with Rosie Thraves, Kirsten Steele. They both work for us in the Justice Collective team. Um, I'll, I'll just say that would suck if they weren't working for us. It makes my life a lot better having them. They are amazing. They carry a ton in their own right. And we're, but we wanted to take a minute in the middle of the month of what is justice, where we've interviewed other leaders and we've heard other leaders' opinions and thoughts and input on the idea of justice, which we value and we've loved those conversations. I think they've been really, really solid, but I, I definitely wanted to take the time to do it as a team, like that we're actually addressing that, that we're talking about our drive as justice people, our ideas about justice. And again, our hope is that these conversations, like they stimulate you guys, our listeners, followers, to you know, engage, get involved, show up in ways you need to show up. And maybe as we're having the conversation to it, like it opens your eyes to maybe mindsets that you've been holding that were limiting you and kind of keeping you from truth or fullness or everything there. And so, yeah, stoked to be sitting down with you, Rosie, Kirsten. How are you guys? What's up? Doing good. Doing well, thanks. <laughs> I'm still just laughing over our last attempts at this when we're all in one room together. Yeah. We did. We we took a stab at doing it all in the same room and to no avail. It was just clear outbursts of laughter throughout. And yeah. uh, so we're following into what might be a little bit more comfortable for us, which is you're in another room and I'm in another room. <laughs> <laughs> Work for right now. <laughs> so, so we were, we definitely were talking about this together pre the recording to kind of get on the same page. And I wanted to start kind of lead the conversation. One of the things that we had mentioned to lead off was what is our thought around biblical justice? Because I think culture says something justice is that doesn't always reflect God's idea of justice. I think, you know, for me being a Westerner, if I use the word justice, I might have an assumption about incarceration or um, punitive measures, like something to hold the wrongdoer accountable. And that can be an element of justice, but God's idea of, you know, biblical justice typically includes a lot more. And what we want to lead with there is the idea of restoration, that, that God's in the business of restoring wrong things in the earth and making them right um we would say like he gets involved in the mess and his involvement in the mess is about bringing healing bringing transformation bringing shift like he doesn't sit on the sidelines and watch human suffering and just wonder how it's going to work out um so i think for you guys like do you want to talk a little bit about your own like what you think justice is, how justice is pretty central to your following of Jesus, anything you want to say in there, and then we'll just see where this goes. Yeah, like I, it's funny, because as you, this didn't come to mind earlier when we were talking about this, but actually my, my decision to follow God was actually solely based on how active I felt he was in people's lives, you know, because um, yeah. I was, I grew up a Christian with Christian faith, but I definitely I think when things got rocky for me in my teenage years, I very much pulled back from God because I really felt like he wasn't active and doing anything in the world. And I couldn't really, you know, looking at love and what love does and how powerful, and, you know, a force it is to come in and protect. And it's very compelled to do something for the sufferer. And then, you know, seeing what I felt was God at that stage in my life where he wasn't active, it was you know actually caused me to pull right back so I think for me like it's something that you can't you can't have one without the other because the nature of love is to protect and to do something it's a step forward you know to get in the gap and help so um yeah I, I guess like for me it's never been a hard um hard putting two and two together there it's just you can't have one without the other so yeah uh, it's beautiful Kirsten, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, just um, <clears throat> just thinking about the Father um, and and just how Jesus, um, you know, like and just the cross and redemption and just the life that is given um, in in place of like 
just what we would have deserved without the cross um, yeah. and the life that's given through through Christ and just the redemption that just it's so much um, justice there and in that place it's um, that's like what Rosie's just saying you know just like it's out of the heart of the father that that he um, sent his son so we, we would have like access to him and and freedom there and so we received so much and we're yeah. so rich as sons and daughters and it's really just about giving that away mm. yeah that's good yeah and, and you're like referring to the cross i mean that's a big deal like god stepped down he didn't he didn't stay distant mm -hmm. and where there was human need and where there was a gap he filled the gap um like he actually came in not to confirm sin and not to verify judgment but he came in to release mercy and to give people access to a higher way i know for me and like my journey um again i mean i think everybody has their story and i think that's one thing that the church doesn't do a good job of is we tend to compare our stories to each other and start to like put certain stories at a higher threshold than other stories and I don't think that serves anybody. I think the reality is like, we all have a story and we've all been somewhere. We're all headed somewhere. And in my, my particular journey, I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't have any sort of um, like Christian context. Um, and it was, yeah, life was pretty crazy. Um, you know, parents split up when I was really young, that whole divorce dynamic essentially led me into a reality of a single mother trying her best, but she and her of herself had been through so much brokenness and so much pain that her kind of like competency in parenting wasn't, you know, whatever we want to say at the highest level. So life was really chaotic, a lot of craziness, drugs in and out of the home, different mm -hmm. men coming in and out of the home, definitely not a feeling of stability. And in that space of fatherlessness, and in that space, space of brokenness, um, yeah, I mean, it just became normal to fend for myself. And I think, I don't think, again, I don't think this is an abnormal story at all for someone that's grown up without their dad in the picture. But yeah, I was, I was in trouble a lot. I was really familiar with the principal's office. Um, I knew that side of the, the counter at, at public school. Uh, definitely always in and out of fights and always in and out of situations of just not being the, the good guy. I was the bad guy and, you know, cut to the chase. My mom is the reason I met Jesus. She got saved when I was a teenager. So I think I was 14. So still pretty young. I mean, I'm not, I'm not that old of a guy. If you're 14, you're, what are you still in junior high school? Right. And her life, I mean, it completely switched. And I came to discover that that switch was connected to Jesus. I'm like, Oh, Okay, that that changed. She's a different person now. Well, cut to the chase. My story, I didn't really like, whatever, give my life to Jesus son in my young 20s, 22. And for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe not having church in the background. I don't know, maybe going through craziness as a young guy. For whatever reason, my yes to Jesus very naturally equated to, you know, he's he's involved in the lives of the broken. Uh, I was seeking him you know, in the secret place. I'm like, Lord, I just want to be with you. I want to be where you are. I want to be, you know, I want to be closer to you. He's like, well, if you want to be with me, then, and then he named, he actually named the kid that I was mentoring at the time because I was a youth pastor. And he said, I'm with so-and-so. I, I won't name his name. We'll just call his name Johnny, even though it wasn't his name. He's like, I'm with Johnny. If you want to be with me, then be with Johnny. And it was just very clear at the beginning of our connection, he lives to revive the spirit of the contrite, like he is invested in yeah. those whose lives are not on the whatever up and up, like they're struggling, they're in some measure of need. I mean, the Sermon on the Mount is so clear, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the kingdom belongs to people who are experiencing some measure of poverty. We like we want to define poor in spirit as the, the homeless guy in the corner. But yeah, it definitely includes the homeless guy in the corner, but it's such a bigger definition. Who is poor in spirit? Well, that's who gets the kingdom. So I think, I, I don't know, from, from the, the early days for me saying yes to Jesus equaled, oh no, I'm, I'm just going to be available. I'm going to be open to the Holy Spirit. And in being open to the Holy Spirit, 
there's always that nudge to be in the lives of people that are also journeying, right? And uh, when I say those that are journeying, I'm saying all of us, like maybe some of us are in a better station of life than others, but the reality is like, we're all on the same level. <laughs> if somebody's on the streets or if somebody's like a really famous preacher, it doesn't matter. Like they're all on the same level. They're human beings that are in a journey, caught up in the journey of life, right? Um, I'm starting to preach now and I don't typically do that in these. This isn't good. I don't, I don't want to be the preacher guy. <laughs> so I think, I think for me, what I'm trying to summarize is like, it's no justice is re it's redemption. Justice is healing. Um, justice is God showing up in any circumstance among any people group, confirming his goodness that he is a God of love. Like I love how Rosie put it. Like he gets involved. Yeah. He's, he's not on the sidelines, just kind of like, well, I hope they figure it out. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so do you guys have anything to add to that? Anything you want to, like, I know, Rosie, to your comment earlier with your own story, like you didn't feel like God was getting involved, but yeah. it sounds like at some point you felt like he was getting involved. Yeah, it was amazing, actually, because I think, because I pulled back for a number of years and I was just like, I'm going to do it my way, you know? Yeah which is natural, like you have to, don't you? If there's not, if there isn't God in the picture or whatever, you, you just, you do it your way. Um, but it was, I think it was years later when I started going back to church and I found a church that was actually very active in, um, you know, it was open to the Holy Spirit and, you know, basically the nature of who God is, you know, the true yeah. nature of who he is, not who we try and present him as or, want to believe he is in our religiousness you know but um and I I remember seeing you know just healings and things like that taking place it was like oh God is actually active he's mm -hmm. actually doing things then he must love people you know um he didn't make this hierarchy because that was always my frustration it was just like this very stale environment in the church where it was just you know, there was definitely people believing that they'd been chosen and therefore if they'd been chosen, then the other people that didn't know God have not been chosen, which is not meant to create pride in us, is it? It's, you know, it's just we're all chosen, actually. God wants all of us with him. So, um, but that was kind of my backdrop. So then, you know, having an experience where he was more present and actually doing things physically in people's lives, healing them emotionally. Um, I could actually see the nature of God for what it was. Um, but I love that quote, um, justice is the restoration of every violation against love. And I love it because it's very all embracing. Because when you think of even like a perpetrator, suppose you've got someone he's probably like on the worst end of the spectrum by our standards. Like suppose you have like a male sex offender who abuses children, you mm -hmm. know, when you look at his past at one point, his high likelihood he was a child um, victim, you know? Mm -hmm. And then at what point does he become the person that deserves punishment versus mercy? You know, we all deserve mercy. We've all been victim to something. We've all been violated. Um, against love you know and and actually God wants to come and heal the perpetrator and the victim so that that cycle doesn't continue um, so I just love that I love that quote because it really does capture it for me that, that's a big deal right there like when you're the example that you cited somebody that's that's um, a pedophile preying on children mm -hmm. I think, I think that would be probably the classic example where people would, maybe their reflexive response, their innate response would be throw the book at them, you know, yeah. just, just throw the book at them. And, and yet I think that is a dynamic of justice, isn't it? There's a verse, an old Testament verse, the survivors of your wrath live restrained. And so there's a dynamic where there is a accountability in our lives when we when we cross the line and when we do hurt others when we make messes so to speak like there is a dynamic of like oh there's recompense like oh, i actually have to suffer the consequences so to speak and yet the way god outside of time looks at a situation he doesn't just see a pedophile 
he sees, oh, that, that individual as a young boy was himself violated and like takes into account this, this much more complicated landscape and looks at the complexities of, this, of that equation or that situation and like, how would God treat that individual? Yeah. Would there be mercy there? And I, I might, my heart screams, there would be mercy there. Mm-hmm. Like, like he would meet that individual with the kind of love that heals them yeah. and forever changes yeah. the dynamics that are operating in them. Yeah. Now, would that, would that healing include the accountability that brings consequences for his actions? Probably. Yeah, it probably would. Mm-hmm. I know like even the conversation around trafficking. So somebody that's trafficked others and they repent and they ask God for forgiveness, should they still be held accountable for exploiting others and, you know, sent to prison and doing time. And like, this becomes, this becomes like potentially a really challenging conversation. I would think God has mercy for that individual, but I also think justice would include levels of recompense, whether they're doing time, um, whether they're, going to those who they, you know, physically exploited, took advantage of, hurt. Yeah, I mean, so justice isn't just like this flowers in the field, everything is nice and pretty, okay, you're forgiven, and now we're all happy. Justice does include um, consequence, accountability. But again, I think we lead in the West with justice equals doing hard time and punitive and you're going to and you're going to prison and that's not the biblical concept of justice the biblical concept of justice is he's righting wrongs and he's healing the earth and he's bringing people into what the old testament calls shalom where everybody has access to thriving you know living in what we would say is abundant life and that abundant life includes i, I mean it includes so much peace of mind it includes right relationships It includes taking responsibility for the way we've broken relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It's it's not always so simple. No. Because we as human beings, like, we are good at making messes, man. I I don't know. I am pretty good at making messes. You guys are probably clean as a whistle, but. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, so Kirsten, anything else? I guess we're talking about, like, you know, actual biblical concept of justice. And I think you had a scripture you wanted to share. I think the Bible has a lot to say about justice and it's, it's good to get yeah. in there when we can. Um, I was just reading in Isaiah 58, similar to like Isaiah 61, just like the restoration and, and just um, the heart of God behind that. Um, and then verse six, it talks about Um, The fast that I've chosen is to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to set the oppressed free, um, and that you break every yoke. And isn't it your, um, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. And I just feel like that's just um, such a powerful expression and and words of like the gospel and just the heart behind god um and like when when we were wicked and when we were like heavy and burden and um you know when we had heavy yokes and and those places where god's like set us free from um we just like have the honor to be able to share that to share our bread with the hungry to um to cover the naked and and that's just um, like you, you mentioned about the kingdom of God, like being righteousness, peace, and joy. And I was just thinking about how just his glory just, yeah, it just also mentions about his glory. Um, then in the next verse eight, it says, your light shall break forth like the morning and your healing shall spring forth speedy and your righteousness shall go before you. And the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. And I just feel like there's just, um, it's just so much just in the presence and just his presence and his glory in just giving away what we've received. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which gets to another point. I think there's a, there's a, there's a reality, a dynamic. Um, I don't, I don't, 
I want to unpack this dynamic. It does seem like at times the word justice can be, I don't know, like a polarizing term. Like if we bring up, yeah, that we're doing works of justice, that potentially there's like, a, well, that's reserved for some people in the church. Like some people do justice and other people, it's like, well, I don't really belong there. I know we get that feedback a lot as we're doing classes or events. People come to us often like, I never saw myself as a justice person. Right. And now I see like, this is completely central to the gospel. Like this is as normal as following Jesus is doing justice. Do you think that's because people have misdefined the term? Or do you think it has something to do with how we can enter into us and them realities? Maybe it's both. I think it's just like, sometimes people can get overwhelmed with the amount of things that are going on in the world and yeah. just can seem like such a big out there kind of concept when it's really just the day to day. Um, you know, like, I mean, you might be working in a situation like we're doing, or you might be, like I kind of mentioned just a baker at a bakery, but like being able to, to speak to someone and bring life um, redemption into their lives, like the person in front of you, I don't know, like Heidi Baker talks about like um, ministering to the one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's very, mm -hmm. very similar. Um, just that, that kind of thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so like in, do you think some, somehow we're separate from doing justice because we've misdefined the term, Rosie? Yeah. And I was just, it's funny because even again, I was just thinking like, it, it's almost a synonym for healing, really, when you think of the heart of it. Yeah. Like, you know, justice is the restoration of things that are wrong. Like, so even talking about being a bake, you know, in a bakery. And you can speak life to somebody if they're believing a lie and they're locked in a lie. It's, it's an injustice to who they are as, in their identity. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's healing, isn't it? In a healing, yeah. it's, it's financial healing. It's, you know, generational healing. It's whatever, whatever you know, area that's in. Um, but I think, yeah, the, I don't honestly understand it myself. Like the term justice has never turned me off because I just think, like, why would you not want people to live the fullness of who they are, you know? Um, and why would you not want to get involved if someone is stopping and hindering someone else from becoming the fullness of who they are, or the devil stopping people from reaching the fullness of who they are, you know? And that's what, that's all justice is, isn't it? It's actually like creating that, you know, ability for someone to reach that place. Um, well, well, I think, but I think, I mean, we're learning as we're having this conversation. I think, I think there you go. I think probably those that, you know, don't resonate with the word justice have probably had the term mis misidentified yeah. and, and misdefined. So we, we're saying, no, this is just like healing. It's God's restoration of brokenness in the earth, essentially. Like justice is God's restoring broken things in the earth to generalize. Yeah. And then other people hear the word justice and they think something other than that. And so they either excuse themselves from the table, like, cool, it's not a part of my, you know, as a Jesus follower, I don't need to do justice because it's, it's a political action <laughs> or it's being an activist yeah. or it's, well, it's so super intense people that are always pissed off about something in the world. And that's not me. <laughs> so I guess this is good. Like, let's just clearly define the term. It's God's restorative energy in the earth, like healing broken things, broken people, brokenness, giving people access to thriving or what the Bible calls shalom. Very simple. And then in that sense, I don't know, maybe even using the word justice could be a problem. Maybe we shouldn't even say the word. because it just, it just like puts this big line in the sand that's not a it's not a needed line i do think another side of the conversation though what kirsten's reading out of isaiah 58 like hey there's a there's a true devotion and the devotion includes including the poor or the needy or the naked or the hungry you know matthew 25 lord when did we ever when did we ever clothe you when did we ever feed you, Lord? Like, when did I ever visit you as a stranger? He's like, anytime, anytime you did it 
to the least of these among you, you did it to me. So, so Kirsten scripture brilliantly shared Isaiah 58. It's like, but there is a dynamic where we do not share our bread, don't we? Like there are times and seasons of life where we're not clothing the naked or we're not, I mean, now I'm going to get specific. We're not reaching outside of our lives to include other lives that may be without or that may be impoverished, right? Why do you think that happens? Because we're all guilty. Like there's none of us that have not, not done that. What do you think goes down that we kind of, there is that line, there is a separation where we're, you know, we're good and they're not good, but we don't go to those that aren't good. <laughs> I think, I think people let themselves off the hook a bit because they're doing that in the church. Like they see it that like, oh, well, I am giving out to the broken. I am giving out to the needy. It's in the church walls. But I honestly don't think revival will happen unless it is spilling out into the world. Like it's, it can actually happen on the streets as well. Like, you know, for people that just love to conference, you know, go to conferences and they, they are afraid to go out on the streets or afraid to go and connect with their local community. Um, I think, you know, if they're crying out for revival, it's like, well, that you, you have to steward it. You have to bring it mm. into action as well. It's not just about like the, there's one element of it where, yeah, you pray for it, but you can't just rest on that um, and not do the rest of it because, mm. you know, like I, you know, you see revival happening on the streets when we, you know, there are people being touched by Christians who are actually actively going out and finding them because that is the deepest part of brokenness really is those that aren't even coming into the church. They're not even there yet. They need someone to go to them because they're not even thinking that way. They don't even see what the opportunities are for them in life. Um, so yeah, I think, I think sometimes it's kind of like, well, my sphere is in the church. That's what I've been called to. But I really think just to be well-rounded people, regardless of our calling, we have to, be mingling with people that are not like us you know just in in all different environments well and more than that the church is the church called to be a change agent like is the church does the church exist to bring healing to broken elements of society i would say yes yeah. and if the if the answer is yes like that's actually our mission then we can't not be out of the church yeah and yeah, there's value in, in creating um, gatherings and places for people to come to experience God's presence. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But but if you're not going, I, yeah. don't, I don't know if you're living. Again, we're like, we're trying to say justice is central to the gospel. And when the Lord says go, mm -hmm. you know, I wonder if go includes more than, okay, just tell people about Jesus. Yeah. I think it's like, yeah, sure. Tell people about Jesus, yeah. but be salt, be light, like be in, mm -hmm. be in society, be in culture affecting the way culture is playing out. And I mean, we see that where the church has abdicated and maybe just gone inward and stayed within itself. Society, society suffers as a result, mm -hmm. like the, the needle turns the other way. And so salt and light isn't just, Hey, I'm here to tell you about Jesus. It's also to stand up for righteousness and justice and to say, oh, no, that, that's not going to work for people in the long run. So I think being on the streets with the poor is a valuable thing to talk about. But I also think we have to be in the halls of justice as judges, as lawyers. You know, we need to be in the places of media and having our opinions like influence the way media and its construct operates. Right. Um, arts, Hollywood. I mean, in every sphere of society being present and shining, you know, we're salt, we're light. Um, yeah. There's another dynamic here. Like, like why else would we not share our bread with, with those that are hungry? You know, the Isaiah 58 scripture, like, so we let ourselves off the hook sometimes. Well, I'm doing it in the church. Um, anything else come to mind? Cause I, well, I know for me, let me just answer for myself. I know for me, um, like if I'm not intimate with the Lord, if my priorities are out of whack, I don't feel. 
this is the way I'm supposed to feel. Like I don't have the same levels of empathy. Yeah, compared. that's a very good point. Yeah. I mean, I will say, like, I remember this as a kid growing up without God in my life. I was always a very empathetic individual. If people got hurt, I was always like, hey, dude, are you okay? But life comes on us and we get busy and we have responsibilities and jobs and debts. And, and it's like, I can't take care of other people. I got to take care of myself. And all of a sudden, compassion starts to wane and we're all guilty. So that, that's something to be really mindful of. Like, dude, is your heart stony? Or is your heart fleshy? Like, can you feel? And then I can already hear some of the answer. Like, dude, I can't feel everything. If I feel everything, I'm not going to be able to be useful to anyone. And I'll yeah. be like, no, oh, like, it's good to feel. Yeah. Um, yeah. What else happens? And we're just talking here. Kirsten, you, anything you want to chime in on? Just like, just thinking maybe out of sight, out of mind, or yeah. just kind of detaching our hearts to, like when we're driving through town and, and kind of putting the blinders on, you know, when you see the same person on the same corner and, you know, um, sure, like there's that element of like, you know, not um, supporting where they're at, but like, you know, like you need to be sensitive, we need to be aware. Yeah. Um, of, every situation because you know there might be that moment it's like god's saying right now you yeah know? and and what are you going to do with that like are we going to shut our hearts off to that moment or yeah. do we turn around and, and you know follow and it might just be like that moment that's transitional for that person you know might change their life and um yeah so just hey that's of, a that's a biggie like you you just kind of like inferred a little nugget there that I want to unpack. Like sometimes we're like, what? I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't really go help them because they're making bad choices. And I would like, that's a really good thing to unpack for a minute. Cause I think we've all had that run through our mind. And um, I don't know. It's like, I don't know where people are coming from and I don't know their backstory mm -hmm. or history. God does. And what, what's he asked me to do? And I think this is a part of the equation because um, try to follow the Holy Spirit in this, you know, like I, I remember this is, this is a, this story is going to, um, it's going to wrap me out this story. We were, we were youth pastors down in the Santa Cruz area and, uh, and we saw one of our kids, like we called them our kids. It sounds like we like possessed them. No, we didn't possess them, but we really loved these kids. Like they were, they were definitely taking up space in our hearts, you know? And, and we saw one of our girls, you know, she's probably 15 and it's like one in the morning and we're like driving and it's like, she's on the streets walking somewhere. And my heart of hearts, I'm like, I want to pull over and like, see my girl, like, girl, are you okay? You know, it doesn't look like you're okay. It's like one in the morning, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I, like, I prayed, I asked the Holy spirit I, and I didn't tell my wife what I was feeling. I just asked. Rachel, like, what are you feeling? And she says, Lance, I, I feel like the Lord's saying like, no, like, it's not like, you're not supposed to pull over and go talk to her. And I was like, crazy. That's exactly what I felt. Cause my, my gut is like, I want to pull over. I want to connect with her. I want to make sure she's okay. Bit of a rabbit trail here, but I, but I think part of like getting involved and helping does include the voice of the Holy spirit, even sometimes like that time didn't make sense. The Holy Spirit said, no, don't. Mm -hmm. And um, cause I would have assumed he would be like, get out and go connect with her. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but I do this, I reach out cause sometimes I can't reach everybody. Right. Well, not sometimes always I can't reach everybody. Mm -hmm. I try to actually reach out in, you know, in step with Holy Spirit, but I'm never in that mode of like, well, I don't want to condone their lifestyle choice choices. So I don't want to, sit down and talk to them right now. It's like, dude, I don't, I don't know their story. I don't know their backstory, like just sitting. And sometimes we don't do anything because we feel like we don't have the right answers and we won't really make a change, but sometimes isn't just sitting and talking to somebody like a big piece of the answer, just making people feel seen mm -hmm. and giving people an like access to another human being. I don't know. A lot of times I don't stop and help because I'm like, dude, I can't really fix that. And I only want to be invested if it's like the total package. 
And I think the Lord's like, dude, just like be merciful, like extend love. But any other thoughts here? Yeah, I think sometimes people, like you just said, like people almost don't see the point if like someone's very entrenched in sin, very entrenched in a lifestyle that they seem to be choosing over and over again. Um, they almost think, well, why are you? And I've even had someone say to me before, I just don't understand what, I don't get it. Like, why are you doing what you do in the massage parlors? Um, you know, going out and sitting with women who are in prostitution. Um, but it's not like, again, it that to me speaks loud and clear of an agenda. And it's not about what you want their life to look like, even though, of course, we would all want them to live what we have an idea of being the happy and full life, you know, but we forget that our own lens even isn't perfect. You know, there's so much more for us to, to discover of what God has for us. So it really isn't about us projecting onto someone else. You know, I need you to get from here to here to make it worth my time. Right. It's not about that. Like God mm. is the king of kings and still he has time for us in all of our garbage mm. that we yeah. create for ourselves, you know, and the cycles we keep going back through, even though we know better, you know. Um, it's, you know, and, it, and it's also just a very natural human reality like we do want to know that we want the reward out of what we do don't we <laughs> like we want to know that our time and our effort and our you know the sacrifice of caring actually came to something um mm. had something to you, you know that happened from that that was good but it really isn't about like there's so much that's unseen and you know any time you love somebody and you show them that they're valuable that's never going to land flat like that Mm -hmm. that doesn't go nowhere but it just won't do it on your timeline and we have to be okay with that and not get jaded in the process and not get hopeless you know because it's just we need to just lower our expectations really of like it looks just like this (laughs) you know (laughs) in our own time yeah yeah it's beautiful anything to add there Kirsten anything that's bouncing around in your mind on this yeah, I was just thinking of like back in my own life journey, just um, maybe 18, 19 years old, just uh, kind of out on on the streets traveling, just living very um, like looking for what's out there kind of. <laughs> seeking, uh, seeking. Seeking, yes, definitely seeking. And um, just thinking of this moment, I was, um, I just scratched together enough money to get on a Greyhound bus and had no money, super sick. And, and like I was traveling back from San Francisco back to the Midwest and, um, and this gentleman came up towards the, you know, after a couple of days watching me on the bus <laughs> in a puddle. Um, and he just gave me like five bucks mm. and to me and he was just like super kind and it really just like I mean I still think of that maybe 20 20 years later Mm -hmm. well a few more but yeah (laughs) Um, (laughs) let's keep that quiet so yeah just thinking just thinking back of like the value and the importance of just um just sowing life into situations it doesn't need to be like Mm -hmm. the the end wrapped up product of but that still speaks to me. God had me the whole time. He was using me in that moment. And, yeah. and like he really like blessed my heart and you know, yeah. yeah, helped me in that moment. So, yeah. Yeah, I feel like I feel like justice, like justice bridges the gap. Yeah. And where where there's a gap, there's something that's compelling in us that's like, I wanna, I wanna shore that up. And it looks like somebody's not living in shalom or in peace like i I don't know i just feel like jesus wants to get in there like i i think he gets in the mess and he beautifies the mess and wherever we as jesus followers feel separate from that process i'm just like okay like there's some work to be done in your heart because because we're all called to be invested in that process of healing restoration like beautifying the world and and i i want to say this really emphatically we're not the savior and we don't have all the answers. And like, I don't approach people so that they can somehow have my life 
I mean, that's ridiculous. My life is not perfect. I'm still in that mess and I'm yeah. still coming into wholeness and fullness. And, but, but where love is not real for individuals, I mean, I feel like that's, that's the call to be a justice person and to follow Jesus as he leads into that space to yeah, make wrong things right, to verify healing, to, to demonstrate that he cares, that he's yeah. invested, he's real, he's not on the sidelines. And yeah, I do feel like, wow, the church is so called to that. Like yeah. if the church somehow feels permission to not be involved in that landscape, I'm like, well, it feels like you're no longer the church. Whoa, that sounds heavy, but I'm like, I'm saying it, like, then you're not the church. If you're not invested in transformation and healing, then how can you say you're the church? Yeah. Right. And I will say this, like, as I think we're attempting to land this thing, I feel like we've been talking for a while, but I have no idea. Um, if, if, like my my Christian context, because now I'm a Christian, and I'm I do have a church background, and the way I read history is that revival leads to reformation. So, like what what that means is my personal encounter with Jesus, like it should naturally translate to a new like a an ever unfolding trans um, experience of Jesus for others. Um, I think of the Second Great Awakening, Whitfield, the Wesley brothers preaching, and how what the Second Great Awakening gave birth to was a cultural reformation called the abolishment of the transatlantic slave trade. So this William Wilberforce cat gets saved, meets Jesus in the midst of the Second Great Awakening, and his personal devotion to Jesus leads him in his position of influence as a parliamentary leader to affect social change. He sees crazy injustice and says, that's not like the kingdom of God. Let's shift it. And he feels responsible to like get invested there. So we can explain these things away and we can talk about how like, well, no, I just need to get more mature in my faith, or I just need to get more of my own healing. But the reality is like Isaiah 58, as I'm invested in the healing of others, my light will come. My healing will come. So I just want to say that like revival leads to our, our cities and our towns being influenced by the goodness of God, like his reality, the kingdom, you know, the love that Rosie's speaking about, right? Um, what do you guys want to say on that? And again, I'm preaching. This is terrible. It's good. Yeah. It's so much terrible. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> um, you guys have anything you want to chime in on that point? Because um, I guess what I'm getting at, like, yeah, like the one, of course, like, like we have to be willing to stop for the one and yeah. be responsive to what we see in our journey. But sometimes what we see in our journey, it like maybe it's bigger than, than an individual on the streets. Maybe it's like a systemic issue we see in our generation that we're like, man, I, I feel like something's got to change there. And yeah. I just feel like it's a wide open playing field, you for know? Sure. Yeah. The invitation is pretty broad. Yeah. yeah, it's like what what's like God dreaming or what's the dreams that God's putting in your heart? Like, what are you dreaming for? Um, and like the body of Christ is just so many functions. There's many different uh, parts of the body. It's like um, I love it. How is that? Touching? I love it. Yeah, yeah, and it's not like to be a you know to fulfill social justice. You have to be anything different than what you already are because God built into each of us all of his nature, you know? And so I do think it's it's about whether or not we nurture and grow different areas of ourselves. Like, you know, that you, you shared that really great um, talk by Jordan Peterson the other week with our team Lance about you know he very much talked about how there is so much inside of us even on a genetic level that we never tap into because we just don't move in that direction and it's yeah. actually stepping into it that you develop that skill or that talent whatever you want to call it but you know yeah being well and he was, yeah and he was talking about risk avoidance he's like like <laughs> yeah like, hey, if you're going to actually step into fullness, you're going to face things that scare the crap out of you, you know? Yeah. yeah. 
And so, but I, I, I don't even think like it's like, it, we're not trying to grow another arm out of our body, like to be doing justice if we don't feel like <laughs> we're <laughs> oriented in that direction. It's just about exploring all of who we are, but actually broadening ourselves a bit and our minds a bit to include others and their needs. You know, it's not, it's not just about sitting in the church and getting, working our way to the top of the hierarchy or working our way to the top of our, you know, financially, you know, so that we can run in spheres of influence, whatever. Yeah. That's what it's about. Like we've got influence everywhere we go every day. Come on. And, you know, we're supposed to be a light in any environment we're in. And so it's just incredible to me, like even looking at the some of the themes we've been doing over the months where we've, you know, well, one minute we're talking about, you know, um, adoption and foster care and, you know, yeah. just all kinds of things that very much interlink. And when you go to the base level, it's like dealing with one issue basically deals with them all. Yeah, you know, yeah. so don't underestimate the power you can have in a moment where you are just being you in the environment you're placed in um, to, to walk, you know, as the person you were created to be on the earth and to let your light shine and it will have a huge ripple effect you won't necessarily know it and get the credit for it but it's not about that you know so yeah. <laughs> I think it's just it's just being who we are but actually being responsible with with the calling the wider calling not just like oh I'm called to be a musician and that's it or whatever you know yeah that's really good yeah I love that quote it's 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 amazing what can be accomplished when it doesn't matter who gets credit for it mm -hmm. so so sometimes, yeah, like, well, I'm, I'm not doing, I don't want to do this because I don't think, of, I don't think I'll really make impact. No, it's just like, do what's in front of you. I think that, that is a, probably a big point I'd like to finish with. And I already mentioned this earlier, but I do think justice grows from our intimacy with God. And he does have destiny for each of us, potential within it, each of us that may be yet realized. And I do think it's smart to follow him as he leads. Like, it's one thing to just kind of do what maybe might be a, like a hot button topic, or maybe it's like really strong in culture. So I'm going to go get involved there, but it's a whole other thing to be like, Lord, what are you, what are you laying on my heart? Yeah. What are you actually asking me? And I do that in my journey, Lord, is there something that you're asking me to be invested in? And, you know, we should take a few minutes here. Like we don't just sit around and talk about justice. Thank God. Like we're invested in doing justice in our community. And those projects are the direct result of times in the secret place where we feel like the Holy Spirit's spoken to us, you know, like in my, in my case, he was speaking to me about working with youth. So we started some mentoring projects in public schools. He was speaking to me about trafficking. So we started some local projects. Thankfully, um, those projects do not exist just because of what he told me. He speaks to other leaders around me and they start building things like our advocacy program that Rosie has developed. He was whispering to her about that. And so she built that from scratch. And, but I, the point I'm making is like, we're invested in things that have a measure of like resonance with us. We're like, yeah, my, my, my heart's drawn there. And that, that matters to me. And I'm not happy about what's going on there. There's like a divine kind of indignation or a righteous anger to like bring shift. Right. Um, but, you know, all that to say, it doesn't mean we won't stumble upon somebody like the Good Samaritan account. Like he stumbled upon somebody in need and he didn't need God to tell him, okay, help this guy. The, yeah. the, the point of the story was he helped the guy <laughs> that he stumbled mm -hmm. upon. Um, but I do think the landscape of need and the earth is so big and so hairy and so broad that we can feel overwhelmed. Like, where, where, where do I start? I, I would start where you feel some impulse you know, where you're feeling a sense of drawing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, you're probably going to have to face some fears and you may not feel fully equipped to get something done. Um, I don't know, man, maybe I'm just stupid. I, I just feel like that's, that's part of the joy of living is like being in over your head, you know, and having stuff that you don't, you don't feel fully equipped to handle. And, but like, Hey, I want to, I want to learn. I want to serve. I want to grow. All right. What is justice? Wow. We talked for a long time. 
I'm really glad that you guys are contributing in this conversation. You guys have so much to share. I do think as we're wrapping up, um, for those of you guys that are following us or taking the time to listen to these interviews, um, get in touch with us. Let us know your thoughts. Like, like we'd love to hear your guys' perspectives. And again, our, our whole purpose in doing these is hopefully we're opening people's eyes. Hopefully we're removing kind of some of those mental roadblocks that keep us from engaging. And, um, you know, we just feel like we all, we all, as Jesus followers, all of us have access to the transformation we're talking about, bringing healing, strength to the earth. Uh, any parting words, Kirsten, Rosie, maybe something I haven't brought up you wanted to bring up? Uh, you mentioned a quote. I was going to read it from, I think it's from Arenas. Um, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. Yeah. And, uh, I just felt his glory and his life is just all over that. So, yeah, to just get out there. and that was, a, that was a talk we gave in the living room gathering last week. And, yeah, Irenaeus, like a like a kind of an old school saint, he's like, the glory of God is, is a human life fully lived, par to paraphrase. So yeah, like live out what's going on inside of you, go for it. Um, yeah, and, and, and just, a, just a strong exhortation. If, if you all happen to be one of those individuals that, you know, you say things to yourself, like, well, I don't need to do that. I'm, you know, like, and maybe there's like a level, like you're leveling, like I'm at this level and other people at that level. I just feel like the gospels, we're all on the same level. And so whatever people's journeys are, we all need each other. And maybe, maybe somebody's come up, coming from a gang background and they're standing next to somebody who's like a fifth generation pastor. That, that's still right here. Like we're all on the same level because we need the same mercy and we need the same love. And, and I don't think God compartmentalizes. I think even, even the like, he's a Christian and he's not a Christian. I don't know that I even see that because the gospel clearly states we're ambassadors sent to implore people on his behalf saying i'm not treating them as their sins deserve like that is the gospel that in jesus we're all free so there is this dynamic of like let's open wide our arms and let's bring people close let's not mm -hmm. judge each other and um and also don't feel the responsibility to save the world just you know just live with an open heart and play your part mm -hmm. and yeah gosh we could talk for a long time I'm going to say goodbye. Rosie, do you want to say anything parting wise? Um, I, I actually, I don't want to keep this going. Just one last thing. I just want to say that because I think we've spoken to a few different people groups, I suppose. But one thing that I think we haven't maybe touched on is um, how people can, it can actually, they just genuinely don't feel good at talking with people that are different from them from different backgrounds you know whether it's the homeless or the gang member or whatever um but it's it's not about you know again it's a skill you learn you have to get out there there's going to be some embarrassing moments there's going to be some moments where you just feel like oh man that didn't go well they didn't appreciate what I was trying to bring or my heart there it's going to happen, but it's worth the risk and just don't, it doesn't have to impact your identity. If it, if you flop on that, you know, wow. it really doesn't speak to who you are. Yeah. It doesn't speak to your worth or your skills or your talents. It's just, it is literally like you are trying something new for the first time. Just, you know, it's going to be a process of learning. So yeah. That's great. That's so good. I'm glad you shared that. And yeah, the simplicity of what we're talking about is loving others, right? So now yeah, let's, let's do that. All right. That's cool. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, we're jumping in next month. We're going to be talking about family wholeness. We've made that discovery as we're like unpacking issues and looking at solutions. It's just crazy how central uh, family wholeness is to the health of the earth. And when families are ripping apart, it's crazy. The issues that ensue so excited to go into that journey, be interviewing people in different spaces. Um, again, make sure you connect with us on our Instagram page or over on our YouTube channel. Justice Collective is our YouTube channel. It does help when you subscribe or you hit like on the things that we're sharing. And if any of what we're doing is um, hitting you in the right way or encouraging you, uh, share, share it. 
why don't you just go ahead and share it on your stuff and share our stuff with your friends. And we feel like the collective is us, not just us here, Lance, Rosie, Kirsten, and Redding, but collective being us, this wider movement that God's doing all over the planet. And uh, we just love the different stories that all of us are in the middle of. So um, appreciate your guys' time. Bless you. This was a long one. Maybe you had to make it two parts. That's okay. God bless you all. Peace. We love you. Adios. We will see you soon.